Hi, I'm Betsy Tonkin, also known as Elizabeth Samut Tonkin. I am a member of the Knoxville Bar Association and a recently retired assistant United States attorney. I'm here today to interview Carol Nickel, a longtime friend and one time opposing counsel. Uh, we're interviewing this today as part of the Knoxville Bar Association Legal History Video Project, and today is October the 27th, 2015. Carol, will you please state your full name? My name is Emily Carol Smith Nickel, Nickel being a married name. Where and when were you born? I was born in Greensboro, North Carolina, December 5th, 1941, two days before Pearl Harbor. Who were your parents? My parents were Roy Meta Smith, who was Dr. Roy Meta Smith. He was a pediatrician. And my mother was Emily Haywood Worth Smith. And was she a teacher? She was a teacher before she got married and then a homemaker and then after we left home, an actress. And do you have siblings? I do. Um, my sister Nancy is about three and a half years younger than I am and Martha is seven years younger than I am and my brother Roy is 14 years younger than I am. So you're the elder. Right. Do you have any family ties to East Tennessee? Yes, on my, on my mother's side, my great-grandfather was uh, chancellor of uh, the Chancery Court in Dayton, Tennessee. My grandmother grew up in Dayton. And my grandfather was uh, V.C. Allen, and he died in office in 1915. And then the Scopes trial was 10 years later, 1925, and my Uncle Billy, or William Allen, was a uh, clerk first of the circuit court, and then for 30 years, uh, clerk and master of the Chancery Court in Dayton. Did you learn about the Scopes trial as a child? Really the only thing I heard about it as a child or growing up was that my mother told me that uh, when the Scopes trial occurred the boys in the family were allowed to go and the girls were not. Do you have any special interest in the Scopes trial or Dayton? I've got memorabilia I guess you'd call it. Um, my uh, great-grandfather's desk is in my living room now, uh, the one that was in his chambers in, in Chancery Court. And um, it was really quite a pleasure to have depositions in that courthouse on a case that I had. And the, the depositions were in the room where uh, my great-grandfather's picture was on the wall. Now, did you grow up in Greensboro, North Carolina? I did. I did. What was it like growing up in Greensboro? Well, I felt, I really am realizing more all the time how privileged I was. Um, like I said, my, my father was a um, local pediatrician there. Um, my family was, was pretty well known in Greensboro, and I loved my school years there. From elementary through high school, I was involved in student government in what we call then junior high school, now it's middle school, and then also in high school. And Greensboro was really, is a very historic place as far as the civil rights movement. Uh, the sit-ins occurred in Woolworths in Greensboro in 1960, which was my senior year of high school. And that uh, Woolworths is now a civil rights museum. And while I was in high school, we had the first African-American student, um, a young woman, attend. They, decided to have in North Carolina, in that area of North Carolina, a token uh, black student attend each of the schools instead of having a group because of uh, what happened in Clinton, Tennessee. Where did you go to college? I went to college to Duke University and was actually teased about my accent, although I was only 55 miles from home, and I um, um, majored in religion and would have gone on to seminary, but I met the man that I married, um, Bill Nickel, who was in seminary at Duke at the time. And did you and Bill Nickel get married? We did. I finished uh, college early, and we got married in September 1963 and moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, for Bill to serve a church at Halls, um, just outside of Knoxville. What did you do while your husband was a minister? Well, we, um, Noel, our first child was born in December 1964, so we'd only been there about um, 
less than six months when we had a baby. But I also uh, I played the organ in the church and and taught Sunday school classes and enjoyed what I was doing. So you, I know you have one child because you just mentioned Noel, uh, and she was born in Knoxville in '64. And does she have children? She has two children. Um, Emily uh, just is a junior at Guilford College and actually is doing a fall term abroad in Italy now and is a theater major, as was my mother. And Luke is a senior in high school and quite musical. So I'm very proud of my children and my grandchildren. And do you have another child? I do. Um, Chris, who uh, changed his name for business and entertainment purposes to Johnny Rhodes, is um, he uh, majored in business economics at Santa, UC Santa Barbara, and he is an international entertainer and magician, and he's living in Cambodia now. And I fail to say what my daughter is doing. Um, my daughter graduated from Erlen College and, and got her master's in social work at, in um, Carolina, in Chapel Hill, and she is working as a mitigation specialist in North Carolina, which is working under contract with attorneys who could, um, whose clients could get the death penalty. She works as kind of like a paralegal for them, getting to know the client though, and and even um, meeting the the family and preparing a portfolio to try to get their sentences, uh, the, the client sentences, mitigated from death to a lesser. You mentioned that your daughter was born in um, in Knoxville. In yes, and our son Chris was born in Winston Salem. So you moved back to North Carolina when at the, some point. We did for uh, Bill to serve a church in Winston Salem, and we were there for four years. And then we moved back to Tennessee, to Kingsport, and I've been in Tennessee ever since. And that was in. Um, in 1970 that we moved back to Tennessee to Kingsport. And when did you move to Knoxville? Moved to Knoxville in the summer of 1972 for me to go to law school. What led you to go to law school? Well, I've uh, said this before. I went to law school to try to change the world and at age 30 I should have known that I couldn't change the world. <laughs> but I'd been involved in Winston-Salem in working with a low-income African-American neighborhood there. And then when we moved to Kingsport, I uh, became involved with the League of Women Voters, and that had a lot of influence on me. Um, and then I, uh, we also, both my husband and I, worked on a local coalition to try to get the city of Kingsport to pass an open housing ordinance so that the African-American PhDs who came to Kingsport would be able to choose where they lived. So when and where did you go to law school? I went to the University of Tennessee and I started in the summer of 1972. What was UT Law School like in 1972? Well, when I f first entered law school that summer, there were seven women who entered at the same time and there were only 11 women in the law school as a whole. So it was a quite a different picture for female law students. Uh, there were, I think, 25 that entered that fall, and then each year after that, more and more. So now it's my understanding that the law school at UT is probably over 50 percent female. But it was, it was really, um, I guess, both an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage to being such a, a minority was that we came a very, became a very close-knit group. Um, we formed an organization um, called Law Women, which was the women law students, and we met together and we pushed for some changes that we wanted to have made in the law school, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for those years. Were there any specific activities that you participated in while you were in law school? I did. Significant? Yeah. Thanks to Bill, who did a lot of the, the homekeeping and taking care of the children, I was able to become involved in some uh, activities such as we, we had a group of students that met, some of them were former VISTA workers, um, which was, is the United States form of the Peace Corps uh, then, and we uh, formed what later became the local chapter of the National Lawyers Guild. The National Lawyers Guild was uh, organized 
and I'm, I think it may have been in the 1940s when the American Bar Association was still segregated. Um, and so uh, that was an organization that I kept my membership in and, and stayed active with. And then I also learned about and became a member of Save Our Cumberland Mountains, which has a different name now, but Sockham. Um, and then worked on uh, the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, there was a move at that point to try to get the Equal Rights Amendment uh, passed, which would have given equal constitutional equal rights to women. Worked on a pamphlet, um, an educational pamphlet with some other law students, and another uh, uh, pamphlet or booklet about um, the rights and responsibilities uh, legally of high school students. What academic experiences, if any, did you have in law school that had an impact on your later law practice? Looking back on it, there were several. Um, one is that I um, worked um, in directed research under Professor John Sobieski. I did a research paper on Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and that was a statute that I probably used more than any other one statute in my law practice when I began doing employment law. And then I also uh, took a prisoner seminar uh, taught by Professor Neil Cohen, and I did um, prison work uh, later too. And then I did, um, I guess it would be called uh, directed, it wasn't research, but it was under Professor Judy Ittig, and another law student and I taught an undergraduate course on employment discrimination. And I must say that the one student that I remembered from that class, because she was so outstanding, was the person who is now Chief Justice of the Tennessee Supreme Court, Sharon Lee. She was an undergrad at the time and in that class. Where did you work after law school? Well, I had worked part-time while in law school as a student assistant at the University of Tennessee Legal Clinic. And so after law school, I was hired as a staff attorney there, and I worked there for four years. And it was a great time to be at uh, at the legal clinic and at Legal Aid, we actually were it, we we were in neighborhood offices to begin with for about a year, uh, with one attorney in each office, and then consolidated to the office on Gay Street, which is still there. And I was able uh, during at least part of that time to specialize in housing. We had a, a really full staff, and we were able to have some specialties. After the UT Legal Clinic, where did you work? Then um, I, there was a new office that had opened under the Department of Interior, uh, the Field Solicitor's Office in Monksville, uh, to enforce the uh, newly, um, newly passed uh, Surface Mining Reclamation Act, which was to uh, enforce reclamation of uh, coal strip mine sites, and there were new regulations. It was during the um, uh, Jimmy Carter's administration. So I went and I worked there for two years, and um, the thing I loved about doing that too, well, we, we covered three states, Alabama, Virginia, and Tennessee, with administrative hearings and federal court hearings, but we also went out in the field. Um, and I remember one particular time that I was um, on a mine, go, trying to go onto a mine site near Chattanooga, Tennessee, we always we went on the mine sites with the inspectors so that they could show us the violations, and we would have, you know, more knowledge when we went to court or to a hearing about what was happening on the ground. We got to the mine site. The operator called their attorney, who was Mike Bohm in Chattanooga, and we were denied access to the mine site. And what did you do? Well, I called the office here in Knoxville immediately. They called the, um, the clerk's office in Chattanooga. It was uh, Judge Frank Wilson was the federal judge. And they set up a hearing for a mandatory injunction about, you know, an hour later, two hours later. Well, and I had on boots and painter pants, which are jeans with lots of pockets. I was not dressed to go to court. And I could not go into Judge Wilson's court like that and would not have wanted to. So the clerk's office went across the street and borrowed clothes for me from a secondhand shop, and the secretary loaned me her shoes. 
And the, the hearing went fine, and we then met in the judge's chambers to work out the details of the mandatory injunction. It got to be five o'clock, and I looked down at my shoes, and I knew the secretary was supposed to go home, and I felt like Cinderella. But the secretary waited, and we were able to finish our work with uh, Judge Wilson, and she did not come take the shoes off my feet. <laughs> <laughs> what caused you to leave the Department of Interior? After President Reagan was elected, he uh, appointed uh, as Secretary of the Interior James Watt, and um, they didn't, were not enforcing the Federal Surface Mining Reclamation Act as I felt it should be enforced, so I left. You resigned? I resigned, So uh, what kind of immediately. What did you do after leaving the Department of Interior? There was a local citizens group, the Tennessee Valley Energy Coalition, that had a case against um, TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, and they were challenging the uh, fact that TVA ratepayers were having to pay interest on loans for nuclear power plants that had not been put into operation and were didn't know when they'd be put into operation. So um, I was was asked to case manage that case. There were like three three of us on the case, and I did that for about 10 months until that case was over. So what did you do next? Um, well, let me, let me say one other thing about TVAC. <coughs> we were in a little house on Laurel Avenue, and um, that um, was just quite a different experience than being with the Department of Interior when we were, you know, in very well-equipped offices and all. Um, I then, um, I worked with Rural Legal Services on a part-time basis. We were, at that point, uh, my family, my husband and children and I were living out at Camp Wesley Woods in Blount County, so it was quite a commute to Oak Ridge, which is where the Rural Legal Services Office was, but they had some cases in federal court, specifically a fair housing case, that I uh, went and worked with them on a, a part-time basis or kind of full-time. Um, Have any while. special memories from that time frame? I do. We were, I was in court with Lenny Kroos, who was a, a staff attorney and handling a case that later went to the Supreme Court, a fair housing case. And I was uh, second chair, so I was sitting at council table, and it was Judge Robert Taylor's court. And uh, he, Lenny introduced me, and Judge Taylor looked down from the bench and said, young lady, are you one of those people that does those discrimination cases? And at that point I hadn't, but later I certainly did, and kind of chuckled about this memory. And Lenny said, oh no, Your Honor, She's a very fine person and a really good attorney, and she doesn't do those cases. What, what did you do after that? Well, actually, while I was working with, legal, um, with Rural Legal Services, I was working on getting a grant to do some environmental work. And so um, Gary Davis, who had a chemical engineering and law background, and I opened an office in Knoxville working with the Legal Environment, Environmental Assistance Foundation, which was a public interest law firm started by a woman fresh out of the University of Alabama Law School. And I was able to do uh, litigation uh, representing uh, SOCOM, the Sierra Club, Tennessee Citizens for Wilderness Planning, which was uh, based out of Oak Ridge, but a regional environmental group uh, working to enforce the um, the Surface Mining Reclamation Act. And when did you leave LEAF? LEAF became uh, a Florida uh, law firm and, and kind of pulled out of Tennessee. And so I went into private practice, and this was in the, the early 80s, and was solo at first and just had a general practice. Did that practice develop? It did. I then began, um, first of all, my office moved, um, began sharing space with Millie Cunningham, who also became a very dear friend, and, um, and Peter Alleman, a friend, and, and Dave Gall, who 
then he was with us till he went with the public defender's office. So we shared space for a number of years, and um, then after that, um, I, I, uh, Jennifer Morton worked with me. We were uh, partners for a brief time, and then uh, for the last um, ten or more years, um, Jim LaFever and I uh, have shared space. So I've been really fortunate to work with some very excellent attorneys and dear friends. How did your practice develop over the years? Over the years, it of course I had, like I said, I had a general practice and then I began centering more on uh, civil rights cases, uh, constitutional issues, did some First Amendment, uh, police brutality, uh, due process, um, Eighth Amendment cases, and, and more and more employment cases, mostly representing employees. So about the last 10 or 15 years of my practice, I did almost exclusively employment cases, um, employment discrimination, age, um, gender, race, um, sexual harassment, um, disability. Um. Was your office always in downtown during all those years? Always downtown. Three buildings on one intersection. Um, Bank of Knoxville, which is something else now, and then First Tennessee Plaza. I love the views of the mountains. And did you live in Knoxville during that period? A good, time? most of those years I was commuting in, either from Granger County, we went back to the land and built a log house um, on that land uh, right after I finished law school and lived there for about nine years and then moved to Camp Wesley Woods for about nine years. So approximately 18 years of my law practice I was commuting. Um, close to an hour one way. And, and then at some point you moved to Knoxville? I moved to 4th and Gill neighborhood and very close to downtown in um, 1990, about 1991. At some point in time, did you move your office to your home? I did. Um, I kept thinking about moving towards retirement. First moved to a smaller office in our suite and Mark Jendrick came in with Jim LaFever and me and then in 2008 uh, after I had, had significantly cut back my caseload, I moved my office home, and then I uh, officially retired uh, June 1st, 2013. But during that time, I moved towards retirement by attrition when I would close cases. So through the changes in your practice over the years, was there any constant? There was definitely one constant, and that's Cheryl Mahaffey, who began uh, working for me when Gary Davis and I were still working for LEAF, and she was our secretary. And she was my only support staff for a few years, but then as I hired more support staff, um, Cheryl became my paralegal and bookkeeper and did all the billing, and she had worked with legal aid both in Charleston, South Carolina and in Tullahoma, Tennessee. So she came with experience uh, to work with me and she was my mainstay. She had the feet on the ground and it got so we could finish each other's sentences. She helped me with research too. I'd give her, you know, ask her to get these cases and she um, was really a, a mainstay for me. Are there cases that stand out in your mind that you've handled through your years in practice? There are a number of them. Um, I specifically remember a couple of prison cases. Uh, one of them, the Bills v. Henderson case, I started and um, actually it was litigated while I was still a staff attorney uh, with legal aid. And then, um, and we, it, that case concerned was, um, well, there were a number of clients who were prisoners at the main prison in, ten in Nashville, Tennessee, and they had uh, done a sit-down strike to, uh, in an effort to form a prisoner's union. They were brought to Brushy Mountain Prison, which was maximum security at the time in Morgan County, Tennessee, put in administrative segregation, which was solitary confinement like punitive segregation. And we filed a lawsuit 
challenging that because their due process rights were violated. They had no hearing before they were put in punitive segregation, which was requ required under the regulation, and we ar argued it was required under the Constitution. And we won that case, and the issue for attorney's fees came up actually right after I had left legal aid and was with Interior, and um, that issue on attorney's fees was, may have been one of the uh, main reasons that the Knoxville Legal Aid and the University of Tennessee Legal Clinic split, and Knoxville Legal Aid then was under just the Legal Services Corporation, National Legal Services Corporation. Where was the trial in that case? The trial was actually at Brushy Mountain Prison. Um, my clients were, it appeared, were deemed uh, dangerous enough that they decided to have the trial at the prison rather than bringing the prisoners, I don't know, there were 11 or 12 or more, I don't remember how many, to Knoxville to federal court. Uh, so it was, it was quite an experience. It was um, in the middle of trial, I was still interviewing some of the prisoners in their cells to decide whether to call them as witnesses, and it was interesting. Is, is there another prisoner case that rings bells with you? Later in the mid-90s, uh, the Jordan v. Davis case um, is one that I specifically remember. There were some others in between, but the, the Jordan v. Davis case facts were that there were prisoners, there was a big group of prisoners at Morgan County Prison in Wartburg, Tennessee that uh, did a nonviolent um, sit-down, and I think it had to do with probably with conditions. Um, and those prisoners were rounded up, plus any other prisoners that, that were around and in the vicinity, and put outside in the prison yard behind barbed wire and razor, razor wire for four days and four nights in 40 degree weather. Um, and so we, uh, the lawsuit that I represented them in had to do with the conditions that they were held in. Um, for those four days and four nights, and it was a class action and a bifurcated uh, jury trial. Um, and so the thing that I really remember about that trial the most is the, the challenges in getting ready for trial, preparing for it. I ended up hiring um, as a uh, clerk to work with me on that case uh, one of the uh, young men who was in the prison at the time in a part of that uh, class to help me find prisoners who'd been released that nobody knew where they were. I was looking for uh, for the best witnesses for this class action and so we did get ready for trial and uh, had a few witnesses and um, and we we won that that case too. So are there any other kinds of cases that you specifically recall? There, there were two voting rights cases, one in 1988 and the other one in 1992, both uh, presidential elections. And those cases, the first one was an ACLU case, I was a cooperating attorney, um, had to do with the fact that mostly young people had, had registered to vote but, but then were not allowed to vote. And that was when the registration had kind of opened up. Some of them, in one of the cases, they had registered at Kroger's, at a table outside Kroger's, and they should have been allowed to vote, and they were not. So um, for both of those cases, I filed a, um, filed, filed a lawsuit, mandatory injunction. And in the first one, I remember that the polls were reopened for those uh, plaintiffs to be able to vote. And the thing that makes me feel that these two cases were significant in my practice is that some of these plaintiffs had never voted before. They were, they were young. They had just registered. And I think it showed them that rather than the system not working and what's it worth that I registered but can't vote, hopefully it showed them the system works and you could vote. What other cases do you remember? Well, there were two um, discrimination cases, and one was against TVA, Klein versus TVA, 
And I remember, well, the facts of that case, first I should maybe briefly say what the facts were. Um, my client was actually, I feel like, one of the many unsung heroes of the civil rights movement. He was the first black machinist at the Kingston Steam Plant. And um, he went to college and got his degree after beginning to work for TVA and was in human resources in 1988 when TVA went through a large reduction in force and also moved the human resources office, dismantled that, and moved it to personnel offices in each plant. And um, Mr. Klein, re he applied to become a personnel officer. Um, at Kingston Steam Plant, and his application was put in a drawer. So we filed, he was never considered, and um, I felt he was very qualified, and we filed both a race discrimination and an age discrimination case on his behalf. Because it was an age discrimination case, also we did not have a jury trial in that case. It was dismissed on summary judgment, went to the Sixth Circuit, and uh, we won, and it was sent back for trial, and it was d dismissed again in the Eastern District of Tennessee. And we went back up to the Sixth Circuit, and I asked for the same panel so that they would be familiar with the case, and, and I did get the same one of the same uh, judges on the Sixth Circuit. And during oral argument, he uh, said, was this the applicant that they put his application in a drawer? And that was like icing on a case. I knew that we, you know, were in, in good shape. And indeed, the Sixth Circuit just sent it down for a hearing on damages. And after that, TVA settled. And uh, let's see. Was there another unpleasant yeah, case? Yeah, yeah. The other one was actually that I remember specifically was against the Tennessee Department of Correction. I was representing a female guard at the Morgan County Prison, and it was a sex discrimination case under Title VII, and she was denied promotion to a sergeant. And the reason I remember that case so well is it's the only case that I have had a remittiture um, in. We got um, what I, we were very satisfied with the jury verdict that we got, and the, um, the U.S. District Judge uh, um, did a remittiture uh, knocking the judgment down, and his reasoning was that there had been a very similar, almost the same judgment awarded against the University of Tennessee in a, in a discrimination case just a few days before. So he felt that that UT case, which was widely publicized, may have influenced the jury. But my client was satisfied with the remittiture, so we took it. But that procedurally, you know, that that's why I remember that case. I have another memory. You're going to ask me about the case that we were um, opposing counsel on. And um, you beat me soundly. And it went to the Sixth Circuit. And I still wish I'd won, or think I should have won. <laughs> and it had to do um, with, it was a legal issue. Um, my client was a, um, uh, a warrior, of, she was with the Department of Defense, I guess it was the Department of, anyway, she was a weekend warrior and a civil employee of the, uh, of the military during the week. And like I say, that you, you beat me on that, they said it should have been in a military court. But the thing I really remember about that case is we argued the summary judgment motion, fighting for our clients in uh, Judge Leon Jordan's courtroom that morning. And then that night there was a Knoxville bar function and we were friends and we went to that together and we were sitting together and having a great time together. And Judge Jordan, uh, I think you said he was kind of at the table behind us and he leaned over and said, well, this is good to have civility among the bar. And so I guess we were the epitome of civility among the bar after fighting it out in court. <laughs> well, we were friends, too. Yes, that's true. We've been friends a long time. <laughs> um, have there been activities that you participated in over the years that while you were practicing that might be described by some as 
outside the box that fit with your goal of wanting to change the world? Well, one that comes to my mind is that I participated in civil disobedience in a city in, in Congressman John Duncan's office, and that's the father of our Congressman John Duncan. Now, it was in 1986, and the reason that we did the sit-in was to, uh, to protest and try to change our government sending money and supporting the, the war in Nicaragua that the Contras were, um, were fomenting and were, were causing in that country um, because it had not really gone through the procedures to, for that to occur. And so we really, we were protesting the many innocent lives that were being lost. Were there some other uh, well, activities? Well, yeah, I mentioned the National Lawyers Guild before, and in um, this is probably not that outside the box, but in 1992, I went to Cuba with the National Lawyers Guild, and I think at that time the American Bar Association would probably not have gone to Cuba. And we were uh, guests of the Cuban Bar Association and the Tourist Bureau and the judges and the lawyers and had a, a whole week-long um, series of what was called conferencias, lectures and seminars on Cuban law, constitutional law. We attended a trial. We went to a legal aid office. Um, it was quite an educational experience and then I stayed a week after that and actually hooked up with the, uh, the uh, City University of New York Law School and went to some places that I'd not been the week before. So that was, that was an educational experience. Uh, any other activities? Um, I've, I've been involved in um, the Women in Black. Um, and that it was started by Israeli women in 1988, standing on the corner in Jerusalem to try to get their government to go back to the 1967 agreed upon boundaries for the Palestinian territories and, uh, and stop supporting the illegal settlements. And, and related to that, um, back in, in 2002, I went with the Fellowship of Reconciliation and the Muslim Public Affairs Council um, on a peacemaking trip to Israel and Palestine, and our whole group was put in detention in the Tel Aviv airport and, and sent home the next day. So we didn't, our trip was aborted, but because it was aborted, I think I had more speaking engagements when I got home than if I'd been able to complete the trip. And um, I was disappointed, but I was able to share my experiences when I got home. Was, was that trip in connection with your involvement um, as a Quaker? It was not officially connected with my involvement as a Quaker, but I um, started attending Quaker meeting actually when the ground war started in the Gulf War in 1991 and then joined. So my Quaker faith, um, the Religious Society of Friends, has, has influenced and continues to influence my outlook on life and, and some of the activities that I'm involved in. Uh, have you been involved in any other um, peace activities? I've been involved with the Oak Ridge um, um, Peace Alliance, uh, ARIPA, the Oak Ridge Environmental Peace Alliance. Uh, for, for years um, and have attended those vigils and their reading of the World Court uh, decision. And that organization has worked for years to try to close or transfer the bomb making um, at the Y-12 plant uh, to some peaceful alternative. So, and, and then, um, yeah, so that, that's an organization that means a great deal to me. Over the 38 years you practiced law, what were the most significant changes in your practice? There have been a number of changes. One thing has been the electronic filing, which I think has been a tremendous help because I remember being on the uh, street at almost midnight trying to get 
a brief mail to the Sixth Circuit so that it would be stamp dated that date. Uh, and then, you know, we've had to get runners to run briefs and, and motions and suits to different cities. Uh, so the electronic filing has, has really been a help. Um, email along with that is, I think, both a help and sometimes a hindrance. Um, it's wonderful to be able to be online or to be emailing with your client and make, I've, I've made changes in discovery requests, discovery answers with my client on the phone and making changes in those documents. However, I think that the hindrance is that we don't talk to each other enough. I remember when I first started doing employment law um, and I, Ed Rayson called me. I had a number of cases against the Kramer Rayson Law Firm and that was my, one of my early ones and at that point I was also in the First Tennessee Plaza bu uh, building. He called and said, Carol, I'd like to come downstairs and talk with you. And so he came down, we had I think a cup of tea and talked about a case that we had against each other and what his client wanted, what my client wanted, where, where we could agree, where we disagreed, and what we might take back to our clients. I didn't see that happening much in the later years of my practice, and I think that's something we miss. Ernie Petroff and I had cases against each other. He was with the um, Howard Baker Law Firm in Huntsville. Ernie once told me that that law firm stopped every afternoon in the middle of the afternoon and had tea together. I bet that's not happening very much now. So those are things that I think we need to look back on and see if we can pull some of that personal relationship back into our law practice. Um, the other thing that I think would have been a huge help to me that is happening now, and this is only in my narrow area of employment law, but that is that we now have a listserv in Tennessee for plaintiff's attorneys uh, who are representing employees in discrimination cases and other cases. And if I'd had that when I was first practicing law, it would have been a tremendous help to be able to talk with other attorneys who were representing employees. We plaintiff's attorneys tend to be kind of solo. Even when I was sharing space, I often was with people who did, did a different type of law. And I did um, get a lot of help from the National Employment Lawyers Association, which is a national group of employment lawyers who represent employees. But they only had a meeting once a year, and then they ended up, I mean, it, as it developed, we had some online conversation with that organization. But to Neela, the Tennessee chapter allows Tennessee em employment lawyers to communicate on a regular basis, which I think is a huge help. Have you noticed that electronic research has made a change uh, um, since you first started practicing? Yes, definitely. I used to love to go to the UT Law Library and the Downtown Library Law Library when we, we had one then, and hole up for a half a day and get away from the phone, we had no cell phones, and just read the cases, shepherdize, go maybe go back later and shepherdize, and, and make some notes and go back to my office and dictate the first draft of a brief. Well, that, that ended with Westlaw and Lexus. It was not cost effective. It was not efficient, and I started doing the research in my office, uh, which was, was quicker, and I would you know, get Cheryl then to get the cases, and, and then I ended up drafting my briefs uh, by typing them on the computer, and I, was, I did fewer rewrites, but I still miss those isolated half days at the law library. What have you been doing since you retired? Well, I've been more involved with uh, the Quakers, religious 
Society of Friends, taking on more responsibility with our yearly meeting, a regional, uh, regional organization or regional, some people would say church. Um, I also, I love dogs and animals and I'm a volunteer with Human Animal Bonding in Tennessee, which is an organization under the UT Vets Veterinary School where dogs are, go into nursing homes and schools and hospitals. And I volunteer with Noah's Ark No Kill Shelter, which is near Morristown. Um, and so those, those are things that I love to do. Plus, hiking, hiking with my dog and putting exercise more as a priority rather than just trying to do it at lunch. Now I can plan to go to the Y and plan when I'm going to run and that sort of thing. Have you been doing any traveling? I've done some traveling and I've been to Galapagos and I've also been to South Africa which was great learning experience about the history of Nelson Mandela and also animals and hope to do some more, although it's expensive. <laughs> do you have any regrets? You know, I think the regrets that I have are probably inconsistent, and that is that I wish I had spent more time with my children. I basically missed their growing, growing up years, and I was commuting, and I was working long hours. And although I love the work, I look back on it, and I, I missed a lot. Um, and the other thing is, especially as I was preparing for this, I wish I'd become more involved in the Knoxville Bar Association. And I, you know, that's inconsistent and I couldn't do it very well with the commute that I had and all, but I really only served on one committee. And I, I think KBA is a lot, it's a lot like a family. And I've participated in a couple of the hikes that the professional committee has, has done. I've been able to do it since I've been retired. But I really think that to become involved in KBA and get to know the other lawyers on a personal basis is real important. And, and it's a benefit. How would you like to be remembered? Well, my, my son went to web school just for one year and he came home from school one day and and said he was uh, going through the uh, lunch line and one of the African-American women who worked behind the counters asked if, so it was, is Carol Nickel your mother? And he said, yeah, and she's, he's, the woman said, well, she's a good woman. I knew that had to be connected somehow with my practice, but I, I didn't know how, you know, at that point. I mean, I still don't. Um, so I guess, I'd like to be remembered as someone who has tried to help those in need and tried to make the world a better place and more equal. Thanks, Carol. Thank you.